Yeah. All right. Uh, thanks here. for coming. Um, uh, my name is Jim McQuillan. I've been a member of MUG since 1985. Uh, and I've been using Postgres for, gosh, probably 17 years or so. Yeah, 15, 17 years. How many people here are using Postgres? So just like five or six or seven. Uh, how many people are using databases at all? Okay, a lot of this subset over here, right? <laughs> a few others. MySQL, people using that? MariaDB. And then there's all the rest. There's uh, SQL Server and <laughs> Oracle and all those things. I know nothing about those databases. I know very, very little about MySQL. But like I said, I've been using Postgres for about 17 years. Um, I won't claim I'm an expert at it, but I can get it to do what I need it to do. <laughs> um, I, run a, I run a company. We provide a practice management system for doctors, uh, mammography clinics specifically. And we've got, uh, in one customer, we've got a database that's uh, approaching 700 gigabytes of patient data, which is big for me, but it's not really huge in the world of databases. Um, it's all on Postgres. It's all replicated. Uh, people using Postgres, how many of you are replicating your database? Nobody. How many people are we backing believe, it up? We all believe in yeah. single points of failure. Yeah. Okay, good, good. Uh, well, good. I hope you guys learned something tonight. I, I've been using replication for five or six years, and I, I absolutely love it. Uh, it, uh, it takes away the, the scary feeling of, uh, of you know, having your data out there on a, in a database and you know, hoping the server doesn't crash. Um, so tonight we're going to talk about two features. Yeah, yeah. We're going to talk about two features, replication and table spaces. And they really don't have anything to do with each other, but there is a tie-in at the end that I'll tell you about. <laughs> tonight we're going to talk about 95% replication. Table space is only about 5% in tonight's talk, but uh, I will cover it. And if you look at the manual, table spaces is one page <laughs> in the Postgres manual. So there's not a lot there. Um, but that's all right. It's not, that, it's not that hard. It's just a very useful thing. So replication. The use of redundant resources to improve reliability, fault tolerance, or performance, or all three. Um, makes sense, right? Uh, when you talk about replication, there's a couple of different kinds of replication, or a couple of, a couple of uh, uh, key words that are kind of important. Uh, you've got your synchronous replication. Uh, that is where you, you write something to the database, and before your write call comes back to your application program, it's committed to the, to the replicas. Okay? So you, 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 you commit a transaction, and before that, that that uh, before you're free to move on, that transaction is amongst, uh, I don't want to say all of your replicas because you can configure it different ways, but that transaction has been replicated. So you have some safety in your data, you know that, you know that it's out there uh, in more than one database server. So if, you, if your primary database server crashes, you, you, you won't lose the data. Uh, problem with synchronous replication is it's very slow. Um, uh, not every aspect of it is slow, but uh, you know there are there are commands you can do in a database that one simple command can affect millions of rows or tens or mm -hmm. hundreds of millions of rows. That takes a while to replicate, so you might uh, you know you might do a simple update on a on a table and it and it could take many minutes uh, to run or, or longer. Um, and you're, you're, you're uh, uh, well, you might be able to do it very quickly on your local database server. Replicating that data across the network is going to take a long time. So, synchronous replication is slow. Asynchronous replication, that's the opposite. Uh, you, you update your database, you do a commit, and your local database, your primary database, the, the data has been updated. The data is going to get pushed out to the replicas eventually. Okay, when I say eventually, I mean pretty quickly, but 
there's no guarantee that it's actually arrived at the replicas when when you continue moving on with your with your program. Okay, and then uh, uh, two other features of it is uh, master master uh, uh, types of replication. There's master master replication and master slave replication. <laughs> master master is where you have more than one master. You have a, 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 a master database over here and a master database over there and I'm writing transactions to this database and you're writing transactions to that database but somehow they're all getting put together uh, they're, they're, the, the two servers are replicating with each other and all the data is ended up on both database servers it's really tricky to do right how do you how do you do master master or multi master when uh, you're assigning a sequence number Right? I want to insert a record into a table and I want to, it's going to be record number one. And you're inserting a record into the table and you want it to be record number two because it's the second record. But we're both on different servers. We're both doing it at the same time. Uh, that locking, that coordination is really, really tricky. Uh, what a lot of people do instead of using serial sequence <coughs> numbers like that is they'll use like a UUID. So now your, your primary key is uh, uh, what a 28 byte long field or whatever the whatever a UUID field is uh, you've seen them the, the long strings of, of hex characters uh, they're random so when I insert a record I'm going to insert one it's going to have this long string of characters that's random and when you insert a record it's going to have a different long string of characters so there's no conflict right UUIDs and GUIDs uh, they I don't want to say they guarantee no conflict no, no uh, chance of, of uh, two people generating the same UUID, um, but uh, there's a very, 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 very low chance of two people generating the same UUID. Uh, that's what you kind of have to do with multi-master. Uh, master-slave, uh, that is, uh, you have one primary master server, uh, I'm going to I'm going to write to that primary master server, and that server is going to push the replica, push the data out to its replicas. Okay. Uh, much easier to do. Uh, tonight we're going to talk about asynchronous master-slave replication. Right. Uh, for many many cases, that's that's all you need. Uh, when you get into Postgres, Postgres supports a couple of different types of, of replication schemes. Uh, there's log shipping standby servers. That's what I used to use. Uh, and uh, I'll get into the uh, uh, logs, uh, what that means in just a minute. Uh, and now the newer streaming replication. I think since Postgres 9.0, they support streaming replication. And what that is, is every transaction, as it's as it's written to one database, it gets streamed to the other database uh, nearly real time to be synchronized to the to the slave server, the slaves that are out there. Yeah, there's no uh, there's no limit to how many slave uh, how many replicas you can have. Um, how many of you guys uh, write database code? You mean guys, SQL uh, statements or what? SQL that? statements, yeah, where you're updating a database. Yeah. All right. Does that look kind of? I mean, it's very crude, right? Mm -hmm. I'm gonna I'm gonna transfer uh, ten dollars from my uh, checking account into my savings account. All right. Uh, I'm gonna update my accounts and I'm gonna set the balance on my checking account. Uh, I'm gonna subtract ten dollars from it. And I'm gonna add ten dollars to my savings account. Mm -hmm. Typical. Uh, uh, financial transaction example, right? And what happens if, if something fails in between those two, right? You got ten dollars taken out of your checking account, but it never made it into your savings account. Do it the other way. It's gone. Do it the other way. Do it the other way. Do it the other way. Error in your favor. Yeah. Right. Yeah. right. You you collect ten dollars. Right. Uh, when you're writing database uh, code, you really want to do it more like this, right? Begin work that starts a transaction. Uh, update accounts, subtract ten dollars from the checking account, add ten dollars to the savings account, commit. All right. What happens there is if it fails before the commit, nothing gets updated. It's an all-or-nothing thing. All right. Um, 
money doesn't get lost. <laughs> it just never got pulled out of the checking account. Uh, it didn't get put into the savings account. It's just as it was. So if the database server crashes, uh, when we uh, when we replicate uh, a database, it's transactions that we're replicating. It's actually disk pages, for, uh, uh, database disk pages that are getting replicated, but the whole transaction will get replicated. You won't replicate half of a transaction. Right? You won't write half a transaction. You won't commit half of a transaction. Okay, and I, I've got another similar example that's in a programming language. Uh, if you're writing Perl, this is the same kind of thing, but this is how you'd write it like if you were in Perl, right? You, you have a database handle, you begin your work, you prepare uh, a, uh, uh, an update query, you execute, uh, you execute it the first time with $10, I think I'm doing it backwards here. I think I'm adding $10 to my, I think here we're transferring from savings to checking instead of checking to savings. But either way, uh, we execute the, uh, the $10 to the checking, the minus $10 to the savings, and we commit. If we fail, uh, this is Perl, by the way, for those that don't use Perl, uh, we're in an eval. If that thing fails anywhere, it jumps to the end. We check our status, we do a rollback, and then we spit out an error message. So, transactions. Everybody that's doing database uh, work, you're all doing transactions, right? Right, good. Okay, just to set the stage, this is what we're dealing with tonight. Uh, we're using Postgres 9.6.3. I've got a couple of virtual machines set up with Postgres on it. 9.6.3, it's a very current release. Uh, what's that, just five weeks ago? Something like that. Uh, the operating system is Ubuntu 1604. Um, the name of the master server is Test DB Master. The slave server is Test DB Slave. Uh, and the data, I, the database is sitting in slash serve slash database slash pgsql 9.6. So as we work at the command line, that's kind of what we're working with. Any questions so far? Ready? Okay. Uh, when you if you're going to do uh, uh, replication, you have to configure the obviously you have to configure the primary database server, the master database server, to to allow replication. So in Postgres, you know what the pghba.com file is. That's where you control who can connect to your database. And we have to add a line in there, a replication line. So it says replication. We have to uh, give the IP address of the slave. This is on the master. We have to give the IP address of the slave. We have to tell it what our authentication method is. And I always like to put a comment out there saying, uh, that's the line for my slave server. If I have multiple replicas, I'd have multiple of these lines. And I would name each one uh, out in the comments. Uh, or if, if I really felt like I could, I don't have to do a slash 32, I could have done a, uh, a slash 24 and open up access to my entire uh, Class C network. I don't like doing that. It kind of opens up, you know, it kind of uh, creates a hole in your security 256 nodes wide. I don't like to do that. Uh, you can say slash zero, it opens up to the world. Uh, but I like to do slash 32 so that I'm, I'm naming it a, a, a single machine on that line. So that's the change that has to go in the uh, HBA comp file. And there's some changes that have to go into the Postgres QL.com file. Um, we, wanna, we have to listen to, uh, normally when you start up Postgres, it's only listening uh, to, to uh, on Unix sockets. It's not listening on a TCP socket, right? So you have to, if you're gonna do replication, there's no point in replicating on the same machine. You're gonna, your replica is gonna be a different machine someplace. So we set up the listen addresses, either I, I, I set up a star to get all the interfaces, I could, I could name a specific interface there if I wanted. Uh, the, the really important things though is uh, you have to set your wall level to hot standby, uh, your, your uh, max wall senders uh, to some number greater than zero, uh, your keep segments to some number, I'll explain that in a few minutes, and your replications less to five. Um, I'll get into the config file itself in just a sec. 
Okay. Once you've made those changes, you want to restart your database. There's a few changes I made there that actually require a restart. A, a reload won't do it. You actually have to do a restart. Okay. Uh, let's see. I think now's a good time. I'm going to bring up. Uh, Um, you guys that are using Postgres, how much have you gotten into um, wall files and stuff like that? You all know what those things With are? Wall, no. So it's a. Uh, right. okay. For years, I used Postgres without knowing how it worked. You just used it, right? It's probably most people are, are, are doing that. And then I got really interested in how it all works. How uh, you know I can do part of a transaction and then do the rest of the transaction, hit commit, and you know, really what happens. Well, Postgres uses something, and this is probably true of most databases, it uses something called a write-ahead log. So when you start a transaction and you do your first update, you know, you update your checking account, uh, it'll, it'll take those updates and it'll put it in something called a, a write-ahead log. Uh, it's usually pages from the database. It's not, it's not like a log file that you would go look in. You're not going to tail the log file and watch these things happen. It's a binary file. Um, When you do those, uh, I'm not used to this keyboard. Database PG. Uh, this is the um, Postgres directory. Is that font big enough? Or yeah. okay. Um, the the wall the the uh, wall files the log files they go in PGX log, and they're just these things here. All right, they're 16 megs a piece. Uh, these files here. So any transaction that I write is gonna it's going to write those files out there. That's how it keeps track. That's how, if if you're halfway through updating the database and your server crashes, when the server comes back up, it can it can figure out where it was from these files. And, and there's some other magic that happens too, but it can recover itself to a consistent state through these files. Okay. So these files are, are key to the database's uh, um, um, consistency and, and integrity. So these files are what gets transmitted to your, to your slave server. Um, maybe not necessarily the, the whole file by itself. If you're doing uh, log shipping replication, these files actually get sent to the remote server. Uh, you set up an archive command that, that will do uh, like an SCP to, to take that file, SCP it to the other machine. The other machine will be sitting there waiting for it and when it receives it, it'll load it into its, its copy of the database. Uh, with streaming replication, uh, we're not dealing with these files, we're dealing with just bits of data that, that are in these files. So, when we talk about wall files, that's what these are. So, uh, so here when we talk about max wall senders, uh, wall keep segments, and max replication slots, um, the max wall senders are used uh, for transmitting those those wall files. Uh, in fact, in in uh, you really only need the max wall senders in log ship. Uh, you don't. I don't think you need it in, in uh, streaming replication. But the wall keep segments. And the max replication slots, uh, those are both really important. Um, when you, in a minute, we're going to actually create a, uh, our base backup. We'll do a, we'll, we'll create, we'll do our initial copy of data from one server to the other. Uh, and I'll explain more about the the segments at that point, though, the keep segments and the hot standby or the. Uh, Okay, so I, uh, I made my changes to my config files and I had to do a restart. <laughs> okay, then once the database is up and running, um, let's go back here. Yeah. 
So once the database is up and running, I need to create a slot, a replication slot in my primary database. Um, what the replication slot does is it, it's a place where the slave registers with the, with the primary to say, I'm replicating you. Uh, and it, what, what's important then is because the, because the database now knows that something is replicated, something is configured to replicate, it won't delete these wall files until they've, they've been replicated. Okay, or even, all, even the bits of these files have been replicated. So if like my replica goes down, my replica could go down for a week. And if I'm not paying attention, I mean, it'd be pretty bad to have your, your replica database server go down. But it could be down for a week. If I'm not paying attention, that thing's down. And I'm not streaming uh, these transactions to my, to my replica, uh, these uh, wall files will start to collect, okay? Mm -hmm. If I didn't use the, the slots, these wall files would only hang around for as long as uh, that one parameter told them to hang around. So well, there's a couple of parameters, but this um, keep segments is say just a second. This keep segments that you kind of can't see is saying keep at least thirty. Well, if I weren't doing uh, 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 if I didn't have that replication slot set up. I would want to keep more of those, and there's a, another parameter you can say for how long you keep those wall files. Yep. So those are kept on the actual server. That those are kept database. on the primary, the primary database server, and you really want to keep those around until they get replicated. Okay. So. So I'm going to connect up to my database. Uh, uh, and I, I, well, let's do this. See, here's my databases. I called my big, I've got a database that's about three and a half gigs in size. I wanted a database big enough so that it, you could see it replicate. It wouldn't, you know, like if I, when I run the, the PG uh, base, base backup command, I wanted it to take a few seconds to run. So I've got a mud database. Um, I do an L plus. Ah. Let's do it this way. I do a slash L plus. You can see it's well, it's three point seven, three point seven mm -hmm. gig. I'm on database. So uh, I need to uh, create a slot in the replication slots table. So I'm going to select the way the way you do that is there's a there's a function call pg create physical physical replication slot and I have to give it a name so I'm going to call it test db slave okay uh, this is on my primary database that I'm creating this slot. I like to give the slot the name of my, my slave database server, my, my, the slave machine, okay? Uh, in, in, in my big customer where I'm running this with nearly a 700 gigabyte uh, database, I've got three replicas all the time. So the way I can keep track of which replica is which is by the, by the name of the slot. So I'm going to create that, that slot. Uh, already exists. So I, hmm. I was testing earlier, and I, I was going to remove it, and I didn't. Uh, you missed it from P. Uh, so you select yeah star from PG replication slots. Okay. Yeah. So there's a slot already out there. So we'll just leave it out there. I could call the function and delete it, and then call the function again to recreate it, but you guys get the idea, right? Okay, so. You would have one of those for every slave? For every slave, I would have one of those. If I wanted to uh, make sure that I retain all my wall files until the replicas are all copied. And I pretty much always do. I, I, I have no reason not to. Uh, it's an important, though, 
if you are doing replication and you have you know three uh, replicas out there, if you take one offline permanently, let's say you're just taking it down, you're oh. not going to have another yeah. one anymore, or you add a fourth one and you remove the first one, you better remove that that slot, that slot entry, that, the entry from the slots table, okay? Because you will retain all your wall files forever, no. okay. forever. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And there's 16 megs a piece. <laughs> uh, if you have a very busy database, it doesn't take long for that to turn into some some real volume. Right? So, are you going to cover this later? But um, what happens if one of the the uh, slave machines manages to fill up its disk? Or something? Uh, that slave will go offline. It'll go offline. I mean, you know, the, if you if you fill up your disk, <laughs> the Postgres will shut down on the slave, you know, and the master will retain all the wall files. Gotcha. <laughs> okay. And hopefully you've got something monitoring that, like Nagios or something, to to let you know that uh, your one of your slaves just went offline. Yeah. Good point. Okay, so Okay, so that's uh, it's important to create the replication slot. Okay, now to make the initial copy of the data <coughs> For this, um, uh, I have to revert back to the command line. But there's a really nice, handy command called pg base backup. Hmm. I used to have to put the database in backup mode. There's a, there's a function you can call in Postgres to tell the database it's being backed up. Then I would use rsync to copy the entire tree over to my other server. I'd get all the bits in place that I want. Then I would tell the database it's no longer being backed up. Then I would get my slave configured and bring it online, and uh, that would be my replica. Uh, they added PG-based backup that really simplified the process. It takes care of all kinds of stuff for you. I, I have to point to where my database is. This is running on the on the slave, okay, on the slave server. Uh, I'm I'm going to run this command on my slave server. I'm going to tell it where I want to put the database. I'm putting it in the same place on the slave server as I have it on the master server, right? I want to see progress while it's running. I point to the host, uh, what the port is. 5432, that's the default Postgres port. I don't really have to specify that, but I did. Uh, I'm going to use, uh, for those xlog files, I'm going to use the streaming method to get them. Uh, the slot is called DB, uh, uh, test DB slave. That's that slot that we created, right? And I want to write a recovery configuration file. What separates the primary from the master, the only difference in configuration between the primary server and the, mas and the, and the slave server is a file called recovery.conf. On the slave, you have a file called recovery.conf in your database directory. On the master, you don't. When the database starts up, it looks for a file called recovery.conf, and that's where it gets its information for how to contact the, the master. Okay, so when you when you get done copying all that stuff over, you better have a recovery.conf file there. Otherwise, you're going to start your database. It's going to think it's a master, and now you've got two masters. And you can't take a master and turn it into a slave. You've got to wipe it all out and copy it again. I learned this. <laughs> <laughs> they made it easy. Recently, they added the right recovery.conf option to, to the command. Okay. So they made it easy to do it, so it, it creates the file form. So it's just a file name there, there's nothing in it? Oh, there's stuff in it. There's, there's configuration items in there. Uh, I'll show you in a few minutes. It contains the IP address of, this, of the primary. Uh, it contains well, a few other there. parameters. This, this stuff here? Isn't that the IP address of the master? Yeah, that is and for the invocation of this command. Right. But there's, there's stuff that, well, most of what you see here yeah, does end up in the config. That's what I'm saying, yeah. Right. Um, the slot name ends up in there. Uh, you'll see it in a few minutes. I, I've got it printed out here. I've got the slides printed out so that I can run this because that slide's not going to be up on the screen <laughs> when we go to run this thing. Now, I'm wondering if I can just go, yeah, let's just do that. I can, I can easily swipe back and forth between. Right. Okay, so this here is the master. I'm going to open up another terminal. Uh, 
that's going to be 62.242.71. That's the slave. I know it's the slave because it says slave in the prompt. So uh, I need to be. Uh, uh, something I want to point out here: when I play with Postgres, when I when I work with Postgres, I build it from source. Right? You can you can install your latest version of Ubuntu or Red Hat or uh, whatever your favorite operating system is. You can do Windows if you want. Uh, you can install from from the distribute the distributions packages if you want. Right? But what you're going to end up with is whatever version is in that data is in that distribution at that time. Mm -hmm. If your if your uh, server is a, a fourteen an Ubuntu fourteen oh four that's three years old now, you're going to get Postgres like nine point one. Okay, and they're up to nine point six right now. Craig, did you have something? There is a PPA for Ubuntu that you can get. There are PPAs. Yeah, and yes. that is that is supported by the Postgres project proper. Is it? Yes. Okay. So, I like building from source. Yeah. It's it's. <laughs> Uh, this isn't a, a, a presentation on how to build Postgres, but it takes me about three minutes to build it. You, know, you fetch the source, unpack it, dot slash config, make, uh, make check, make install, create a user, set a couple of variables. It's very fast. And this way, I can run that version of Postgres on all my servers, regardless of what version the operating system is. At one point, I had a Red Hat uh, Enterprise Linux 3 from from uh, 2003. Mm -hmm. That's how old that machine was. And it was running Postgres 9.3 when I had 9.3 on all my other servers. So I had the same version of Postgres all over the place. And I wasn't running the server on that machine. I was running the, the Postgres client utilities, the PG, the PSQL and, the, and all the, you know, the, the client stuff. Um, but I had the Postgres 9.3 client tools available on all my machines because I built it from source. There was no way I was going to find a package on Red Hat Enterprise right. 3 to, to support, you know, that was going to be Postgres 7, right? Probably Postgres 7.3 maybe, if I was lucky. Uh, so anyway, I, I built Postgres from source. It's really quite simple. Uh, if you go to the Postgres website, Download page shows you where the source code is. You can download it. How uh, long did it take you to compile? Uh, <coughs> my my entire build process for Postgres is less than three minutes. Yeah, it's fast. It, it's I compile some things on my machine. I, I build my own Node.js too, and uh, Node.js takes forever. Postgres is fast. Um, and, and that's why my 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 database is out in slash SRV. Uh, I, I don't even know where where they where the distributions put the database. It's like var var lib or var spool or something. I think I think it's slash var is usually where the uh, the database files live. Yeah, like var lib. I put mine in slash server. Yeah. Okay. So um, let's see. Uh, okay. So we're gonna we're gonna. Uh, um, I need to become the Postgres user. I like to do all this stuff as the Postgres user. We go into the serve directory. I've got a directory called database. Go to the database directory, and right now I don't have a database, uh, a PGSQL database. If I go to my master, uh, let's see. Yeah. So I serve, so much data here. That's my master. That's my slave. Okay, so we're going to copy that data. <coughs> PG base backup. Dash capital D, I have to point to where I want to put it. PGSQL. Uh, I named my database directory this uh, PGSQL 9.6 because we're running version 9.6.3. Postgres. Uh, the, the dot releases are compatible with each other. 9.6.2 and 9.6.3, and when they come out with 9.6.4, I can just rebuild my, my code and point to the same database, and it'll work just fine. But when they come out with Postgres 9.7, I can't I can't run my I can't run the Postgres 9.7 binaries against a 9.6 database. I have to run a conversion. 
on the database to do that. And Postgres's upgrade utility is fantastic. Uh, you guys ever use PG upgrade? It's really simple to use. It does some, you have to shut down the database, but it does some tricks with uh, sim links or, or actually hard links. When you're all done, you end up with a PG, uh, you all end up with a PG SQL 9.6 directory and a 9.7 directory, and they're sharing many of the same files, but not all of them. When I'm, when I'm, uh, when I'm done with the conversion, I can just bring up the, the new database, and I can delete the old directory, and everything's perfect. So, that's part of the Ubuntu thing too, where they'll run both databases side by side. So if you do a, one of the uh, the point upgrades or whatnot, mm -hmm. it'll um, it'll create a new directory with the the old database that's in there, and then you run. You basically it makes you run all that stuff yourself. Yeah. yeah. But it'll run both of them side by side. So it'll have it at the default port, and then the default port plus. Okay. One. I don't remember what that yeah. is. <laughs> okay. uh, anyway, uh, my my upgrades of Postgres have been painless. Yeah. My, my biggest problem is taking the database down for uh, for a little while. And really, you know, a 600 gig or 650 gig database, you'd think it'd take a while to convert, but it's it's minutes. Hmm. You know, because it, it usually it, usually the uh, the format of the the database pages, uh, all the data doesn't change. It's the system catalogs that change, and those are small. Sometimes the database pages will change, but they still do it really quickly. So we point to the data directory. Uh, I'm going to turn on progress just so you can watch it fly. Uh, we're going to point to the host, h2.168.242.70. Uh, the port 5432-xlog-method. We're going to stream the, X, the those wall files. Okay, uh, And because we're streaming, we need to use a slot. Test db slave dash dash. I want to write the recovery file because remember what I said. If you don't have a recovery.com file when you're done, and I've created plenty of them, you know, just with with the editor. It's only four or five lines, but it's really nice when it creates it for you because hopefully there's no mistakes in it. So I run this command, and 3.7 gigs. It's going pretty quick. Right, eight percent, nine percent, ten percent. It's moving along pretty quickly. Uh, when I replicate that nearly 700 gig database, it takes about 90 minutes. Uh, and you could replicate while the system is up and in production. Right? My, my database on my primary server is up and running. It could be serving requests. People could be adding data to it. People could be pounding the hell out of it. And I can make a PG-based backup of it. How far are you going physically with your... Uh... This here? Well, this one. Not this here is two VMs on the same for right, VMware. Right. Right. But when you're doing your your big database, my big database, I said I've got three right. uh, slaves. Two of them are in the same data center. In the same, uh, they might even be in the same rack. I don't. I, I, don't I don't control the rack. They're just it's just hundred meg or a gigabit networking. It's a gigabit. Okay, the third slave is sixty miles away. Uh, from from the rest of the databases over a hundred megabit uh, uh, network. It's not the internet. It's a hundred megabit that, that virtual a, circuit of some sort. Constraining resource. Yes, yes. Pushing uh, doing a replica over a hundred megabit link across sixty miles of Earth um, <laughs> is straining. Okay. <clears throat> Most things during the day it works perfectly. Run a big command that like updates. 10 million rows. Um, <laughs> there, are, there are commands I've run uh, that do things. That there was one of my ran, it took 18 hours mm. before that third slave was back in sync. Remember I said uh, uh, consistent eventually? Okay, eventually in that case was 18 hours. I'm careful when I do updates, you know, when I when you do it, when you modify a schema. You know, you, you have a table that's been there and you want to go add a, a, a column to your table. Well, you do that and it basically rewrites the table when you add a... Well, Postgres, the way Postgres works, if you add a, add a column to a table and it doesn't have a default value clause, if you just say alter table, create, uh, uh, alter table, create column, or add, add column, add, whatever the syntax add is, column, yeah. add column, um, uh, x flag, boolean. If I do that, it completes really quickly and almost does nothing. It just changes the schema. 
right? But if I say that same thing, and, and you know, what you end up with then is a Boolean, a Boolean field that's got a null value. It's neither true nor false, and it really messes up queries, mm -hmm. okay? So what you really want to do is say default false or default true, whatever the case is, right? You do that, it's got to basically rebuild the table. Uh, you do that on a, on a table with, uh, you know, I don't know, 30, 40 million records. It takes a little while to replica, re replicate that. So in your 18-hour uh, replication yes. that you had, um, how long did it take on the master server to complete, just to get some idea of scale? Seconds. Seconds? Yeah. Okay. And, and maybe many seconds to get to the first and second slaves. The local slaves. Yeah, the okay. local slaves. It, it happened quickly. So if you did something like a, say, an up, uh, a mass delete or something like that, like, let's say you deleted like 300,000 rows or something yeah. like that, and you yeah. put them in a transaction, Yeah. how does that store it inside the ball file itself? Does it just store I, a delete blah from blah, or does it store each of those records you know, being changed? I, 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 I don't know. Okay. I don't know. It'd be interesting to find out. All right. Um, yeah, it's a 300,000. Yeah. Although okay, yeah, log, like log entries, right? Yeah. Well, the walls are supposed to save like the, the, the before page and the after page and and so that it can either finish the job or roll back the job. Okay. Um, I think you, you delete like that, and it's going to take a while. Yeah. Uh, if you want to delete like all the rows of the table, you're going to use truncate. Well, so yeah. I mean, I've, I've been on that side of there. Because yeah. if you do truncate, it doesn't do much of anything. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't, it doesn't I don't even think you could do truncate in a transaction. Maybe I you would can. doubt it. I don't know. Anyway, truncate is like truncate. Okay. But you can see this thing finished. It, I, I timed it when I was doing this uh, back at home. And it's like 15 seconds for me to do that, that uh, PG based backup. Uh, PG based backup is not just for replication, you can use it to do a backup of your database. When you guys, those guys using Postgres, what are you guys doing for backups? PG dump? Yeah. yeah. It's good if, um, okay, that, that 700 gig database I have, uh, dumping that, uh, it's just not possible anymore. I, I guess right. it's possible if I had the time, but in space. Uh, when I dump it, it's incredibly slow because of that of that 700 gigs, about 400 of it is images. Yeah, well, images. It's PDFs. It's it's just blobs of stuff, right? Some of it's PDFs. Some of it's textual. Some of it is X-rays. So it's all kinds of things. Dumping that is a lot of JPEGs and stuff like that. Dumping that is just incredibly slow. Um, so I use PG-based backup to do my backups. There's an option to PG-based backup uh, dash dash format uh, tar and it'll, it'll write a tar file for you. Uh, dash dash compress, it'll compress the thing for you. Um, so when it does a tar file, does it create an ASCII file that it tars or does it create a it just, tar no, of, it streams of it, the backup It's just all done in memory and streams it to a tar file. Uh, and you can even stream it to standard out, so then you can pipe it into something like OpenSSL to encrypt it, which I have to, I have to encrypt my, my backups because we push them off-site, and they, any, any data in a HIPAA environment at rest needs to be encrypted. So I, got, I, I encrypt it with OpenSSL. So, because OpenSSL is a great tool. Is there any speed up with the base backup with any, uh, like adding some jobs? I'm sorry. Like, so, like, if some of the other PG uh, commands have like a <coughs> jobs uh, to spawn up more essentially um, processes to actually complete the task. Uh, you know, I think there is the, the man page is, is your friend here, but like I, I think there's a there. <coughs> I, I don't think there is for when you're doing it for replication. Okay. When you're doing the stream, but when you're doing it like to write to a tar file, I think you can you can tell it to run like. Uh, four copies, and it'll make four connections to your database, and it'll somehow go faster. Mm. Right? I mean, you're still bound by something somewhere as your bottleneck, but yeah, yep. So you said encrypted at rest. What about yes. in transport? Is it master to slave encrypted? Um, it, uh, in this example, it's not, but in my example, it is because I'm I'm using a certificate. Uh, I enforce a uh, certificate on the connection, so when I connect, like when I run PSQL and I connect to the, to the Postgres backend, I'm encrypted with SSL. 
That's something I just recently did. And that, it turned out, you know, I've been thinking about that for the longest time. It turned out to be so simple. <laughs> the hardest part is creating the certificate. I, you know, once you've done a few hundred certificates, it starts to get easy. <laughs> okay, so our PG base backup finished. It took um, 15 seconds or so. Okay, now we got us a PG, PGSQL 96 director, just like the master, right? So let's go into that directory. Uh, and you see at the very bottom there, uh, if you looked at, if you compared this with um, this, that's the master, okay? They are exactly the same uh, with the addition, well, two files. The postmaster.pid file is there because on the master, the database is running. Mm -hmm. And uh, on the slave, we have a recovery.conf file. And of course, all the timestamps will be different because these are new copies. But we have a recovery.conf file. Okay? That's our recovery.conf file. Standby mode on. Uh, that's just required to say that, yeah, we're in standby mode. The connection info, that's how we get connected to the, uh, the database. See, it's already setting itself up to prefer SSL mode. If the server would offer SSL, it would have been an encrypted connection. All right? Then the primary slot name right there, that's, you can tell it to use um, uh, that slot that we created. So that, uh, in fact, right now, the primary database is up, the slave is down. I haven't started the database, <laughs> right? If that primary database is active, if people are writing transactions and updating things and you know, creating new tables and all that stuff, my wall files are starting to fill up. I'm not too worried about it. It's not a very busy <laughs> database, right? Okay, there is one line I like to add to this file. And that is trigger file equals slash time slash p it has nothing to do with database triggers what this is is uh, that tells the database when there's a file in temp called pg trigger file promote this database to master okay oh because you might ask yourself what good is a slave database server if you can't use it right right if 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 your primary goes down, how are you gonna, you know, how are you gonna transition to the other one being, being the primary? Well, aside from some IP address issues you gotta deal with, you can tell this database to, to go into full read-write mode just by writing a file out there. And if I did write a, if I do write a file out there called slash temp slash pg trigger file, I can call it whatever I want. If I write that file out there, the database is constantly watching, just a second about uh, the database is constantly watching for that file. When it finds that file, uh, it, a number of things happen. The database goes out of hot standby mode. It deletes the, it renames the recovery.conf file to get it out of the way, and that database is fully up and ready to run. Bob? Yeah, you said that uh, you can't convert a uh, master back to a slave. Yeah. If uh, you recover by this method, does that make it a master that uh, you uh, can't use? That's correct. Slave? And the other one isn't a slave either, so you'd have to create a third. You'd want to, yeah, slave. yeah. When your when your when your slave becomes a master, you assume that your 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 first master is dead, for whatever reason, it, it dies. So you go and create this file in temp. So now this one becomes the master. You're gonna want to set up a new slave soon. That's why I run three slaves: one off-site, two local, so that if uh, it, you know if the master went down. I could make the slave take over, uh, and I would still have another slave. Now you still have another problem, is both of those slaves were looking to the primary as their source. And I'm not sure, I'm not sure what you would do there. You basically got, you got two databases that are kind of sitting at that point. I don't think you can, I don't think you can rehome a slave to point to a new master. I'm not really sure what you'd do there. What would, what would be the way to promote? I'm not sure what you would do with the other slaves. What I know you can do is cascade your slaves. Right. Okay, so 
So, you know, I could have one or two slaves off the primary, and I could have one or two slaves off of each slave. So, <coughs> when, a new, when, when, when one of my slaves becomes a master, then any slaves it has would still be slaves. Right. Like that's what you need to do, it seems like. I think you'd want to do that. Yeah, rather than the yeah. two, two slaves off the same Yeah. But what if one of them in the middle drops? Like, what uh, if your slave drops Well, if the, the one of the intermediate ones drops? <laughs> yeah. Um, mm. Then you're pretty much going to have to rebuild from that point on, right? Yeah. You, you're going to have to yeah. fix that one. <laughs> right, yeah. And maybe it just went down, right? If it just went down, you bring it back up and everybody's happy. The, the data will continue to flow all the way to the, the third level. Um, but if it died, died, and you had to replace that and create a new <coughs> base backup for it, you're going to have to create new base backups on um, any downstream slaves. Question? Yeah. So when this one becomes, when this one triggers and becomes a master yeah. in that trigger file, do you do you still have to go in and then remove the like? hold spaces for the other slaves, or is it like is this going to be triggering wall files that are not going to be going anywhere? No. Uh, that that PG, PG replication slots table was on the master. It didn't, it, that doesn't, doesn't get replicated to the slave. Oh. Okay. So if I, when I start up the database, we can do a query on that, on that table, and there's no slots there. Okay. So your master starts up with no slaves. Yes. With it, yeah. Yeah, so now it's up to you to, because right. you're going to have to reconfigure stuff. Sure. Uh, I don't think it would be accurate to assume that those slaves are there, right? Um, I've been doing replication for like six years. I've never had to revert to a slave <laughs> as my as my database. Yeah, yeah guess what? <laughs> it's going to happen tonight if you watch. Yeah. Um, have, you, have you done no, a practice run? Uh, yeah, we we brought up the application pointing at the slave and, and that kind of stuff. And I've, I'll talk more about that in a few minutes. Uh, one of the uses I have for having all these slaves. Um, all right, so you understand the trigger file, right? So that we can promote that server to master, should we ever need to. So you just touch that file then? Yeah, you do a touch or a greater than, and just okay. get a file out in the temp directory, and boom, that thing, uh, in, in about two seconds, that thing flips itself around and becomes ready for, ready for rewrite operation. <clears throat> by default, well, I don't want to say by default. Uh, the way I have it configured with an entry in, in the in the Postgres.com file, uh, you can connect up to the slave database and do read queries against it. You can't do writes; it's read only. But you can do reads against it, which is um, for reporting. <laughs> yeah, for reporting. Yeah. yeah. The thing is, you can't write anything. You can't create temporary tables. You can't you can't do anything. Uh, I was a little bit disappointed because I thought, well, what if I did my, my, my backups off of, I mean, aside from my replications, what if I did my backups off of the slave? So what if my, my primary database is just free to run full speed? I'm not putting it in backup mode or anything ever. It's just running full speed. My, repli my replication, one of my replicas, what if I just back that up? Well, when you put a database in backup mode, it has to write something. It has to write a uh, marker oh. to say it's in backup mode. You can't. So have multi-master mode? Have one that you gets that? backed up and not. Postgres doesn't support multi-master mode. So uh, it's coming, though. Yeah. Uh, I keep hearing that it's coming, but it's a really tricky thing. Yeah. <laughs> there may be some stuff in Postgres 10, which which um, um, I think is supposed to be out before the end of the year. They, they're pretty good at coming up with a major release every year. Yeah. <clears throat> well, they're at 9.6 now. And I, I, I don't know if there will be a 9.7 or if the next one will be 10. Uh, well, 10's in beta. Yeah. So, and I don't think master, uh, multi-master is in the beta. So, anyway, so you understand that trigger file. So I, I put that in there. That's the one line I have to add. The rest of it is fine just as it is. Uh, let's see. So now we want to start the database. All right. So I'm in. Uh, uh, let's see. I'm on the slave. So I'm going to do a pgctl-d. Uh, because I'm in that director, I can just say dot start. All right. Um, I, I don't have uh, start scripts in my uh, init, you know, slash etc slash init.d. I, I don't want to say that. I do have start scripts in my production server. 
Uh, but when I'm playing around like this, I don't bother setting up the start scripts because, quite frankly, I'm irritated with uh, what's the new init? System D. System D. Yes. Uh, I haven't mastered it yet. <laughs> so <laughs> on the newer on the newer Ubuntu's, I just use PGCTL, and it and it gives me what I need. Okay, so I'm going to start the database. Okay, and it says future logs are out there and logs. So let's go cat uh, slash serve slash database slash logs slash that. Okay. Uh, let's see. Consistent recovery state reached. That looks good. Starting streaming logs. I think we're we're. I don't think it says it here, but we're good for. Um, we are in standby mode, so I think we can uh, actually open up a connection to the database. I do that. Ah, it's starting up. What am I missing? It says terminating wall receiver process up there. Uh, that was when I shut it down earlier. See the timestamp? Okay. Yeah, that was from my testing earlier. I should have blown away the log file before we did this. Um, standby on in order for me to do that. And change requires a restart, so I'm going to restart the database. It's really easy. Okay. <coughs> now if I cat the log file again. Uh, database is ready to accept read-only connections, so now I can do PSQL minus L, and I can see database. All right, that's on the um, slave. That's on the master. Big deal, right? So that's on the slave. So if we go over to the master, I'm going to bring up a connection to the database, uh, mug, and I'm going to, because uh, uh, my real estate on the screen is rather tight, star from PG replication slots. That's on the master. I actually, it actually shows that uh, replication is active, all right? Active, true. So we are up and running. There's another interesting table, and that's uh, from PG stat replication, okay? And this shows uh, that we are up to date on our replication, that, see, that IP address, that's 71, that's our slave. Uh, there would be a row in this table for each uh, replica, right? So it shows that uh, we sent that transaction, and I think it wrote that transaction, so everything's flushed. It's, it's good to go, right? If you were using IPv6, would it just fit in there? Or I believe it would. Postgres would just Oh, Postgres is, it fully supports IPv6. Okay, so. Let's take it for a spin. I think what I want to do is separate my windows here. Uh, <laughs> no, I didn't want it to. Well, I guess that's okay. Just, yeah. Yeah, that'll work. I was going to make two separate windows, but what do I care if it's connected? <laughs> yeah. I'm not used to this terminal app. I, I don't usually use a Mac. It's just that's what I use on my laptop, but usually my desktop is uh, Linux. Uh, let's see, so this is the top is the master, the bottom is the slave. Right? Yeah. Okay, so uh, uh, I don't have a table called my data. That's what I was playing with. I shouldn't have it here either, right? Uh, well, let's bring up the database. So there, we're, we're connected to the database on both servers. So I'm going to create a table called my data. So create table my data ID integer primary key. Uh, force a habit on this uppercase stuff. I don't have to do it. Okay, so there I just created a table called my data. 
right? And it should be here. And it is. <clears throat> okay. Actually, I want a third window because. Uh, Yeah, I think I'm, I'm actually not going to bring it into a tab. Okay, that's, it, that's what I'm saying. Like, if you wanted to, if you wanted to make it all part of the same. Yeah, I just have to. Uh, like, I do that all the time with Chrome. Chrome, the inter interface for dragging tabs and reattaching them, is really simple. I found this uh, edit, this uh, terminal thing, not quite so. Yeah, that's all you would have to do is it, once you bring it into a tab mode, just drag it into the <coughs> screen mode, okay. and it'll drag right into it. Okay. Uh, I'm going to connect up to the database on the. Primary. Okay, so uh, remember uh, select star from PG stat repl. Right, that was that. Uh, you know, there's a neat, fairly new feature of Postgres. I can do slash watch, and it'll just keep running that last command over and over again every two seconds. Okay. So that's running, and you can see our, our, uh, our slave is up to date. So now let's go over here. Okay. And I'm going to insert a ton of rows into that table. All right. So insert into my data ID. Select star from generate series one comma. I'm gonna do a million rows. <laughs> it'll it'll go pretty quick. Okay, so I think that's six zeros. Um, yep. And before I do that, if I select star from my data, oh, MUI data. <laughs> the MUI data version. Okay, there's no rows. So now I'm gonna press enter. Okay, and you see, yeah, you see this thing is doing its thing. All right. And all of a sudden it's synced up, right? That's pretty quick. <coughs> and now. It's still syncing. The is change, it? Yeah, they're changing. Uh, yeah. I think it's good. Now. Uh, keep in mind, there's things going on in the background. Uh, there could be a vac an auto vacuum running or something that would also affect that. Um, now they're up to date. Yeah. Okay. I don't want to actually select all million rows. Let's select count. A million rows. Um, I can't delete those. Because I'm read only, right? I can delete them up here though. From master. From my data. Okay. Zero. Yeah, so okay. And that'll catch up soon. Eventually. Right there. Okay. Are we caught up? Close enough. I'm just gonna run that command again. I add another zero because it happened so quick. So this, I mean, it's going to take 10 times as long, right? Roughly. Mm -hmm. um, so it's chugging, chugging its way through, streaming. If you do the count on the lower one here, how many are there? Uh, right now, if I'm fast enough at it, I won't see any because of the, uh, well, actually, it didn't try to lock the row. It didn't try to lock the table. But right now, because the transaction hasn't been committed, the slave sees none. Okay. It defaults to being a transaction, even though you didn't specify that. Every every line you run is its own little transaction. If I ran two lines, they wouldn't be a transaction between themselves. Right. 
if I, uh, man, if I did a uh, begin work, um, insert rows, delete rows, commit, the database, the, 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 the slave would never see those rows. All right. Uh, okay, that's. Would it run the two that. commands though? I'm sorry? Would it still run the transaction on the slave? Um, I think that the, it doesn't really run the commands, it just gets page updates. Okay. It, it, it would get those page updates. I don't think that there's optimization in the replication to just not do it. Because mm -hmm. I think as soon as you start the command, the, 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 sync, the uh, replication is happening. Okay. Right? But it, it won't commit at the other end or it won't you know, make it permanent at the other end until it gets the, the permanent signal on this end. Um, yeah, it's still, well, it's still no, doing it's so. Done. It's probably vacuuming because I just inserted 10 million rows. It's probably doing some other stuff. Um, okay, one of the one of the features I use, I, I said I always I always have three slave databases. Um, when you're working with a customer with, with this much data, first off, it's it's health data. Uh, it's a great set of data for me to do testing with. I test my application with it. I can do all kinds of great stuff. You know, I, I write reports. I do all kinds of stuff. I don't want to have that data in my data center. Because first of all, 700 gigs of data would take me a long time to get. You know, if I wanted to suck it across the internet, it would take me a while. Uh, I don't want to do that to my customers' network. I don't want to do it to my network, and uh, and I don't want their data on my system. It's mm -hmm. health data, right? So, uh, what we've got is a couple of test servers in their environment, and we can connect up to those test servers and do whatever we want on them. So I've got one of those test servers connect, uh, uh, set up as a, as a replica of the database. About once every week or two, I will break that replica, turn that replica into a primary, and then that's my new test database. So I've got nice, fresh data. And I'm, you know, I'm working in the medical environment. I've got claims data. I've got uh, event data. I've got just all kinds of stuff that happens from patients flowing through the office. And this is a really busy practice, so there's a lot of patient data. Uh, so I can, I can get a fresh set of data really as often as I want it. All I got to do is just turn that, that slave into a primary and then point my application at it uh, and I've got a fresh set of data. I've got a script that runs then and goes through the database and adjusts things. It changes the title on the practice to test and it changes some URLs so that I'm not updating uh, uh, things I shouldn't be updating. You know, I'm not, I'm not, uh, my application is always going to go to the right database. I'm not sending out faxes. I'm not sending out faxes. I'm not sending out emails. I'm not uh, uh, prescribing medications when I <laughs> test. You know, like we do. We do electronic prescriptions, and there's a test <clears throat> environment for electronic prescriptions and a live one. In my test environment, I better be using the test environment for prescriptions. So uh, all those, you know, there's a whole handful of things. I run this script, and it just runs through and changes all these things for me. Uh, but I can do it as often as I want. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll turn that slave into a master. That's my new test database. And then I'll, I'll start creating a new, I've got a script that, you know, the steps we just went through, the PG-based backup. I've got a script that runs that automates the whole thing for me. So as soon as I've taken that slave and made it my new test primary, I can turn around and create a new slave. So, so now, I might not on the same server, because it'd be in the same database. On the same server, yeah. But it'd be the same name directory. I renamed the directory before I, oh. I, I, I turn it into a master by creating that file out in tab. Turn it into a master, shut it down, <laughs> move the directory where I want it to be, and then I run my script and it creates the new, the new, slave. The new slave of the production primary. So on that machine, I've got like seven terabytes of disk space on it. I've actually got three copies of the database, so I can go back to to try my application with older versions of the database. Um, in fact, since I was just recently given like five terabytes, so now I can have more than three copies of the database if I want. And that's that's pretty nice. I, I like having that kind of that kind of space, and I like not having. Uh, for a long time, I had the data on my system, and then the data got to be like three years old. 
And I didn't like the liability of having a customer's uh, having patient data in my environment. Right. And I didn't like the problem that the data was three years old. And so this works out really, really nice. Can you um, create those those trigger files? I'm sorry? Those trigger files in the temp directory, can anybody create those? Uh, yeah. Those anybody who has access to the database server. Uh, so which is a very, very small set of people. So yeah, you want to be careful. So it's potential attack. Doesn't the temp go clear when you reboot? <laughs> Well, you if you rebooted, well, you wouldn't have. To yeah, but if you if you create that that file in temp directory and it turns the slave into a master, it deletes that file. You wouldn't have to put it in temp either. You can put it oh, in because it's a master. I no, can put I it anywhere I want. Right. But now right. it's a master. It's part of the process is that that file. In fact, that file doesn't automatically get deleted. But I delete that file in part of my setup. I want that file to go away because uh, I. Master. I'm glad you brought that up because the first time I ran my script to go make the new slave, it made the new slave, brought the slave up, and immediately turned it into a master. <laughs> sure, because because that file was out. Yeah, I'm sure. So you don't want to do that. Yeah. yeah. So my script that that creates the new slave blows away that file out in time. And yeah, if you did reboot that server, it would go away. But that's not a problem. Well, once it turns it into it, it doesn't need to stay out there. That's what it I never think. needs to stay out there. Okay. It just needs to exist for a second. So that the database can switch from ma from slave to master. Once that's happened, it, the, once that's happened, the recovery file gets moved out of the way, the recovery.com file, and that's the file that pointed at the uh, at that right. temp file. Right. Right. So. Pretty slow. Uh, yeah. I, how are we doing for time? We got a little more time. Okay. Good, because we can get on to the the, uh, the the second, the the other five percent part of my talk. Any more questions about replication? We can talk more about it uh, when I'm done with this uh, table spaces thing. Too. I just one: is, is there any stats on, on degradation at all? For the more slaves you have, the, de the database will degradate two percent, three percent performance. Um, not that I know of. I'm sure somebody has done some studies, and they might say it's, it's, I mean, it's, they might say it's two percent. Yeah, possibly. Um, I don't consider that a problem. Uh, for the value, but you haven't you seen get. it be a problem. Like when I don't, I don't see it be a problem. And if it was a problem, I'd tell them buy faster hardware or faster network because having us having it replicated is so much more important than a few percent of performance, mm -hmm. right? Because um, before replication, if I weren't doing replication, what would I do? I do what a weekly backup or a nightly backup or nightly I would or think. I mean, the most you're going to do is like a nightly backup, mm -hmm. right? So. I do a weekly backup, uh, uh, along with all of this stuff, I do a weekly backup, right? And you know all those wall files? There's a command, there's a, a, a line you can put in the postgres.conf file called archive command, okay? You put that in that file and it's a script, it's the name of a command. So you write a script, you put out like user local bin, uh -huh. and that script is handed an argument. That argument is the file name of that wall file. So I take that file and I copy it to another location. I not only copy it to another location, I encrypt it. Because remember, the files at rest need to be encrypted. So I, I copy that file to another location, I encrypt it along the way, and, and this is happening all day long every day. So these files are, and uh, uh, encryption also compresses it. Or I compress it, I forget. Anyway, the file ends up a fraction of its normal size. That that 16 meg file that you see there has a lot of, a lot of <laughs> wasted space. A lot of nothing in it. Those are like pages that might have a lot of just nothing. So they compress really, really well. So uh, I do a PG based backup on Saturdays to get the database, and I encrypt and compress that. So I got my base backup, and all week long I've got these these uh, wall files. I accumulate these wall files and I'll end up with thousands of these wall files. Okay, so at at the end of the at the end of the week, like you know, if I back up at, at midnight on Saturday, uh, how often does the server crash just after the backup? It, it doesn't, right? It always crashes just before you were supposed to do a backup. If you, if you do a backup, it always crashes when, when you haven't done one in a while. And maybe in this case it's six days. Right? So I've got a backup and wall files for the entire week. I've got last Saturday's backup and all those wall files. I could very easily uh, take that backup, restore it, 
take those wall files, put them back in the PGX log directory, start up the database, and it'll just it'll start from last Saturday's data and start replaying those wall files until it gets caught up. Might take six hours, but it's way better than just going to last Saturday's tape, popping it in the machine and crossing your fingers. Finding all the patient charts that have to be re-updated. Oh, it would be impossible. Yeah, exactly. It would be, I mean, it's, in, in our environment, it's not just patient charts. It's right. not just the fact that the doctor saw the patient. There's uh, one of the really, really important things in our environment is events, things that happen all throughout, from, from the moment the patient checks in to the, to really till the charges get billed to the insurance, things happen and we track everything. And that's important data for the customer. You're not going to re-enter that, right? Those things happen uh, 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 organically, I guess. It's maybe the way they happen when they happen. You're not going to replay. You know, you're not going to redo that stuff. But if you're just replaying wall files, it's just as good. It just takes six hours, right? So I, I got off tangent. <laughs> I was kind of talking about if we weren't doing replication, we'd be doing backup with with wall files. I mean. And I've, God, I've been doing this for a long, long time to where we didn't have replication. We didn't have wall files. We just did a backup every night. Uh. And, and so then at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, right. you're, you're without the day if, if a crash occurred. Let me get that back. Yeah, at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, your system crashes, and your backup was done last night at midnight. Right? And the tape's still sitting in the computer room. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Uh, there we, we're back. Um, and you've also got the problem of, yeah, you've lost all the day's transactions, but it's going to take you an hour to restore that tape, right? <laughs> or, you know, Probably longer than that. Yeah. Um, in fact, this database that I have doesn't get written to tape. It gets pushed off-site to an off-site server. So we don't have a tape backup, but we've got many copies of the database. Some of them live, ready to go. Some of them a week old with wall files. So anyway, more questions about replication? All right, I've got, I've got uh, table spaces. I think I covered all those things, those things. Take for a spin, we did that, we created the table, created the 10 million rows. Table spaces, okay, this lets you fine tune uh, where the, where the database places uh, its stuff on the file system. Okay, by default in Postgres, uh, there are two table spaces: one called PG Global and one called PG Default. So, and PG Default is exactly what it sounds like. It's the default table space. You create a a, uh, uh, a table, and it puts it in the default table space. Drag this thing up and make it not split anymore. Uh, where's the Where's my guy? Yeah, you go. <laughs> do I just grab a hold of the uh, this thing? Yeah. Well, do you want it, What do you want to do with that one? I just want to make it full size again. Uh, yeah. So just drag it out. Uh, drag it out. Is that like the handle, or no, is that a click, You can just click right on the tab itself and just move like move it. That's what I'm trying to do, it in. I don't think I'm doing it right. There, since it since it died, you haven't really tried selecting another window there. Uh, I don't know what. It, uh, okay, that's that's the slave. That's what I wanted. <laughs> I don't know how I got there, but that's okay. Yeah, <laughs> <that's somehow. laughs> it doesn't matter, right? Um, if you ever poke around a Postgres uh, in, uh, installation, you got this thing called base. There's your. That's the data to the database. I happen to know 16400 is where all my data is. Okay. That's the that's the bulk of the 4.3 gig. It's bigger now because of that 10 million row uh, rows that we inserted. By the way, that 10 10 million rows took 380 megabytes of space. What does that tell us? 38 meg 38 bytes per row. Um, give you an idea of the overhead. 380 million. Yeah. Right, and you did Million? Is it 10 million? 10 million. Yeah. Yeah. So, anyway. That sounds like. In case you're interested, 38 bytes per row 
Like if you factor in all yeah, the overhead, three hundred eighty million. Uh, the only thing in that row is an integer, so that's thirty. What sixty four bits? I don't know how big is an integer in Postgres. Probably sixty four. Yeah, probably. So that's, that's that's eight. That's eight bytes right there. You got an index. You got a few other things. That's not tonight's talk. Uh, so that's the default uh, table space. Um, why would I want to control where it's putting my stuff? Um, why would I care? I I'll tell you why I care. Remember I mentioned I got 700 gigs of data, about 400 gigs of that is images, objects. That's stuff that doesn't need to be really fast access. Right? It's just a bunch of PDFs, it's a bunch of stuff I'm not going to query, I'm just going to retrieve once in a while. I'm going to pull a document out and print it, I'm going to um, I'm going to list documents uh, so, the, so the user can see what documents the patient has. Um, I'm going to display uh, the patient's driver's license photo when we check them in. We're going to see it on the screen so that we can look at that patient's picture and see that patient standing there and make sure that they are who they say they are for fraud purposes, anti-fraud purposes. Right? So we don't need to query those things really quickly. My production database is sitting on 800 gigabytes of SSD. It's, it's like, I don't know, four SSD drives that are rated and, and they're very expensive and very fast and I don't need the 400 gigabytes of images taking up valuable SSD space, right? So I decided I'm not gonna store those, I'm not gonna store that table, it's just one table. It's called object store. I'm not gonna store my object store table on my SSDs, I'm going to store it on slower disk, right? Table spaces. They make it really nice and easy, okay? I create a table space, give it a name, my table space, give it a location, slash serve, and let's say I mounted a slow hard drive on, uh, on slash serve slash slow disk, and I create a subdirectory in there called data. Okay, so I've got myself another place to store database objects. So when I create a database object, like if I create a table, I just say table space, my table space. And it'll, it'll put that table on the slow disk instead of the fast disk. All right? Yeah. Uh, another thing you might, another reason why you might want to do this, uh, uh, and keep in mind, I'm, I, I, can, uh, I, I can move a table is there I created a table. The next line is, I'm going to alter a table. i got a table called My Data. It's got 10 million rows. I can move it to that table space just by saying set table space on the table, right? Interesting thing. When you move a table, it doesn't move the index. This index is going to stay where it was. So I moved that, but I didn't move my, my index. So... That's not, that's not good or bad. I don't want to say it's, it's good or bad. It's, it's good that you have control over it. Can you move the index? Huh? Can you move Absolutely. The maybe. Does it make sense to keep it there? It's maybe. You've, I've got 800 gigs of SSD. Maybe I've only got 40 gigs of SSD, right? Because that's all I can afford. I bought a 40 gig SSD drive. I put all my indexes on there because the indexes you want fast. Sure. Right? Because the indexes are what gets used most if you create proper indexes. Those get used in queries. Those get joined together with other indexes. And that you want really fast. So what I did with my, with my 400 gig table is I moved the table to the slow drive, but I kept the index on the fast drive. So my queries are fast. I can look up what, 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 uh, what documents the patient has very quickly. I just don't get to retrieve the documents as quickly. Okay. Is that, all, is that all an immediate transfer, or can you set it to be like a basic transfer when something is modified and put on the data? Uh, uh, like a kind of a copy on write sort of a thing or something? Not that I know of. Okay. Uh, it happens when you type the command, um, and I believe it locks the table when you do it. So, be ready so for don't, it. Do it, don't do it during normal production. business hours in production, especially if it's a 400 gig table. Okay. Yeah. When you, if you were to create the index on that uh, foo table, yes, 
Um, do you need to specify the table space for the index, or does it use the same one? If, if I, any object I create in the database is going to use whatever is configured as the default table space. Okay, so you have to put table space twice in the create. I, I would have to. Uh, I'm creating the let's index. See. On the create table, I'm pretty sure it's going to put the table where I tell it to, but it's going to put the index in the, in the default table space. Okay? But the important thing is you can change the default. And, and the fact that the default table space is called PG default, okay, one, one's a concept, one's a name, uh, you can have a table space called PG default that isn't the default because you can change what the default is, right? You're, if I change my default to be the slow disk, I'm still going to have a table space called, my do, uh, called PG default. It's just no longer the default. So if I, if I do change what my default table space is, everything I create is going to go there by default. Makes sense, right? So uh, the slash DB command, you see it there? In PSQL, that'll list your table spaces. So let's, let's mm -hmm. I think that's the slave, right? When you uh, drop the table space, did that uh, drop all the tables? No, you can't. You can't. Uh, boy, did I lose my other window? It looks like there's a little no, pop there it is. Oh, weird. Um, slash db lists my table spaces. Uh, let's do that. Yeah, there's my table spaces. I wonder if I put a plus on the end if it'll tell me the size of it. Yeah, it yeah, does. Put it Yeah. Okay, so that's the default and the global. Uh, the global is not very big. That's just the system catalogs and stuff. Um, okay, so let's uh, before I before I run this command, I'll tell you things to watch out for. This is why I tied it together with replication. <laughs> okay, first of all, double check the permissions of where you're putting that table space. Okay, because once you initiate the command. Uh, it's going to try to run, and if you don't have permission, it's going to fail. It fails right away on, this, on the master. It fails in a really funny way on the slave if you don't have permissions on the slave. Or if you didn't even consider what you're doing on the slave. Like you don't have, uh, you don't have space on the slave. Or you don't have that directory on the slave. <coughs> it'll create it on the master. It'll do the job on the master. It'll start copying your table over. And then slave will fail, and then your slave is out of luck. Your master keeps on going, and your slave is messed up. Believe me. <laughs> <laughs> it really does that. do that. And then you end up with this goofy situation. So, so what happened to me when, when that happened, I didn't realize it was replicating that. I, I should have, but I, I didn't. And it replicated it, and it had permission well enough, but it didn't have enough space on the slave. So I ran out of space doing the replication on the slave. When I found that out, it was still going because a 400 gig table takes a long time to replicate to uh, to move. Uh, so I canceled the command on the on the primary. So now I ended up with this case where I've got I've got half a thing moved over. The primary was happy, but there was still something in the new table space that I I ended up having to remove it manually. I learned a lot about table spaces uh, over the period of a few days. Uh, so anyway, double check the permissions of where you're putting this new table space. Table spaces are replicated, so make sure that all your replicas have the same layout. Um, and once the table space is created, it's just as important as the rest of the database. You can't start that database up if that table space is not there. Right? So you might be used to having your entire database under the PGSQL directory, and then all of a sudden you've got another database out, or another chunk of your database out on another disk somewhere. They have to stay together. They can't act independently at all. So let's let's see if we can do what I said. Right? I'm going to create a directory. Um, uh, let's see. Well, I can do this. As, I'm going to do it in the databases directory. I'm going to make a thing called my table space. Okay. It's owned by um, Postgres. Postgres, and I'm going to do the same thing here on the on the primary. I 
call it the same thing. Otherwise, it'll just get confused. Okay. Right so we're going to create a table space. Uh, what was that syntax? That was um, uh, give it a name and a location. My my table space location slash serve slash database slash my table space. Boom. So now we got table space on both. We should. Go look in my. Yep, we got, a, we got something in there. So we got us a table space. That's that's what Postgres names it. Goofy name like that. It looks like a ding. It does, doesn't it? Sort of. Other than well, uh, 131 in the end, yeah. And it's 2016. Yeah. It's August 131st, <laughs> 2016. Maybe it is. <laughs> if you extend 131 days, best. Well, August. actually, it could be August thirteenth in the first. Yeah, I don't know. That, I, the last. Maybe it's just random. Uh, it's just a number, I think. So anyway, so we got us a table space. So now, uh, alter table my data set table space. should be going. That's done on the primary. It's done on the secondary too. Oh, sorry, D U S S H. Yeah. So it just moved my table. It just did it delete moved the files. I'm sorry? Did the did it delete the database level files? It should have. Yeah, it should have. Uh, I notice uh, our, my my main one is still 4.9 gig, but there's probably a lot of uh, PGX log files out there. Yeah, it's 1.1 gigs of just X logs. Those go away by themselves when the database feels like making them go away. Right. So when those go away, my database is going to be down to 3.0. Eight gigs, which should be somewhat smaller than it was. Maybe. Um, okay, so uh, if I do it slash d on my data, it should tell me. Yeah, see, it's uh, now the when I, when I list the table, it's telling me what the table space is. Right, it's in my table space. Or normally it doesn't tell you the table space when it's in the default table space. Uh, so, you know, you can create objects in the in the table space. Create indexes, tables. Um, Don't, I thought you had to move the index. I do have to move the index. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, because if I if I slash di. Well, that makes it look like the index is in that table space. Data peak. Yeah. Uh, let's 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 move that. You don't have to move it in order to use it. No, yeah, but alter index. Want to really. Let's see. Maybe it's alter index it's my data p key set table space my TBLS space. Let's see if that takes. Big, uh, well, my table space got bigger. That index is huge. Well, the index is, the table only has one oh, column. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and that, and that column is also the index. So, yeah, the, the index is about the same size as the table. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, yeah. To go back up the top and list the table again and see if it shows. Yeah, if, I guess the it index. probably won't look any difference if I. Yeah, it does out of the oh, end yeah. now. Table space, my table yeah. space. On the end of the index. And if I just do a DI on my data, PK, it doesn't say. If I if I do a, uh, a plus on it, 
does it tell me the index is 214 megs? Hmm. Yeah. So, table space questions? Interesting little feature. Yeah, right? You run out of space in wherever your database is, right. you can create a table space and move some big files, big tables over there and, and kind of create some more space. You gotta manage them properly, but they're there. Uh, obviously, they do get replicated. Uh, there's, uh, if you are gonna play with table spaces and replication, read the man page on PG Base Backup because it tells you how to handle where to put the, the base, the, the default table space, and how to tell it where you wanna put the other table spaces. You can set up this mapping that will cause those other table spaces to be put really wherever you want. <coughs> you don't have to, but when you do the PG base backup, you don't have to end up with the table spaces being in the same layout, which is handy. Uh, and you can't do a PG base backup in tar format when you have table spaces. Uh, no, excuse me, you can do tar format, you can't send it to standard out because now there's there's two separate streams and you can't you can't send them both to standard out. So read the man page on PG base backup. Can you send one of them to standard hmm? out? Can you send one of them to standard out or? I don't think so. I don't think so. because um, you when you do the tar you have to give it a directory of where to put the stuff and it's just gonna put both files in that directory into the tar. So read the man page. It's your friend. Um, for more information on replication and PG based backup and table spaces, I highly, highly recommend the Postgres documentation. It's some of the best documentation I've ever read. If you look at it in PDF form, it's about 2,300 pages. <laughs> wow. They cover everything and they do a really, really good job. I, I love the software and the manual is every bit as good as the software. And I think that's why there aren't a bunch of books out there. You know, you can't you can't go to well, you can't go to Borders anymore. But if you there's could, <laughs> there used to be a handful. Around, like, there's like two or three that. Yeah. that are okay. And Pat uh, Publishing will publish a book on just about. Oh, anything. they'd be happy to publish it. Um, there's nothing like the the Postgres document. No, they're they're rubbish. Yeah. So, any more questions? I think uh, my time is uh, wow, look at that. 8.30. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you.